Good day again and welcome to another session of story time and I must ask apologies. Um, I had to have had this message out again uh, already yesterday and I got caught up with um, stuff that we're doing for the worship team. Um, so sorry that it's out late and thank you for your concerns. Uh, Lani gave me a message and asked where am I? Uh, she's worried about me so I think she had visions of me being in hospital but as you can see, I'm, I'm quite all right. I'm not coughing. I don't have the fever. So thank you for the Lord for that. Um, but yes, let me pray for us and then we'll jump into that session, our first of three sessions around Mount Sinai. Lord, thank you so much. Thank you for the privilege of learning from your word. Thank you for the privilege of encouraging one another as we speak about it. And I pray for your revelation as we talk about this portion of scripture and about your laws today in particular, Father God. I pray that we will hear your heart and every one of your instructions uh, to this nation that you called out for yourself. And I pray that you will give us revelation about how that speaks into our lives um, and what we must do with that in our di day and time, having your law written on our heart. We trust you for revelation, Lord. Thank you. Amen. So let's maybe start by just recapping about the journey up until the mountain. And they moved from Egypt. It took them three months exactly to get to Mount Sinai. In the third month, they came to the mountain on exactly the same day as what they left. Um, and then they are going to camp around the mountain for the next two years. So we're going to break this up because the story sort of gets um, to a halt over here. Because it's two years at the mountains, there are not two years of story taking place. But we sort of have to read between the lines. What is God busy doing with the nation? So first of all, today we're going to look at the laws. We're not going to discuss all the laws that there's given because there's, there's a lot. But we're going to start to touch on the laws, starting with the Ten Commandments that the nation heard audibly at the mountain. And then looking at some of the laws that follow directly after that. In our next session then, we will look at the instructions for the tabernacle, um, which will take up the greatest portion of the rest of Exodus for us. Um, so it's hard reading. Uh, let's talk about that in one session then. And then thirdly, we'll um, get to where the books all fit in um, at this time, uh, because that makes the way that you're going to read them different. If you know, when do they speak into this 40-year period that we're about to look at? All right. Um, uh, so let's then start off in chapter 19. Um, at the start of chapter 19, then, it says they came to the mountain. And um, remember that scripture that I keep quoting for us, Exodus chapter 3, that says, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. God speaking to Moses before he went back to Egypt. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Um, imagine what it would have meant to Moses as they came across and on the horizon this mountain appears. This promise of God renewed. They say, ah. Oh, God has really spoken to me. I have heard the Lord because he has the promise fulfilled. He brought me and this entire nation back to meet with us on this mountain where I saw the burning bush way back then. And here they are then, camping around the mountain. And Moses went up to meet the Lord and then came back from the mountain to speak to the people and said, this is what the Lord says. He says, we must be a holy nation. A royal priesthood called for his service, and he will be our God. And the people's answer is then given to Moses, yes, we will be that. Uh, we will obey the Lord. We will be his priests in this world. Consider what it means. You will be a royal priesthood. They serve as God's intercessors on the earth. That's the role of a priest priest is somebody that stands in the gap for somebody else, that comes to meet with God on behalf of somebody else, that brings a sacrifice on behalf of somebody else, or brings intercession. Uh, they are saying, yes, we will be that. We will be a nation of intercessors for this world. On behalf of this world, we will stand in the gap for you. Um, and then Moses went up 
on the mountain again and brought this answer back to God and said, this is what the people say. So he is now the mediator going up and down the mountain. And we're going to see him going up and down several times, but not always alone. He goes up on the mountain and says, this is what the people say. Then God says, all right, I want you to go down and tell the people that in three days time, I'm going to have a meeting with them. And they will audibly hear my voice speak to you so that they will not doubt that I'm God. Wow. They've already seen the, the ten plagues. They've seen the signs that Moses is throwing down his stick and it becomes a snake and pick it up again. And the hand and the side. All of these miracles they've seen. They've seen the Red Sea open up. They come through the Red Sea and then they see... Um, brackish water turns sweet that they can drink it uh, they see manna come down from heaven food that nobody's ever seen before they seen quail blown in for the entire nation on a wind and uh, they seen a uh, water running from a rock uh, in a desert enough to water the entire nation they seen all of these things and now god says i will let them hear my voice so that they will know that I am God. God just continues to reveal himself. And we can take that to our own heart as well. In a relationship with God, God continually reveals himself to us. He makes himself known more and more and more as we walk with him. Uh, but this one is going to be something frightening. So he goes down the mountain. He says, consecrate yourself. Make yourself holy. Restrain from certain things. Uh, wash your clothes because on the third day God's going to meet with us. So on the third day, early the morning, they hear a trumpet blast and there's lightning and uh, there's thunder. The people get ready and they get to the foot of the mountain and the mountain, the entire mountain is trembling. Imagine it. Imagine us as Cape Town come together around Table Mountain and the mountain trembles. And there's lightning and there's thunder. And there's this trumpet blast coming down from the mountain. And it just gets louder and louder and louder. And then <laughs> Moses goes up on the mountain. And um, God says to him, you go and better go and warn those people. Uh, if they come over a threshold onto the mountain, they will die. And God says, no, we've put perimeters around the mountains according to your instructions. They cannot come up the mountain. Uh, they're safe. So they see Moses going up into this smoking mountain. And then God answers Moses from the mountain. And they hear his voice. And what do they hear? They hear chapter 20 of Exodus. Uh, many of us who have grown up in Reformed churches, we would have recited this on Sundays. The Ten Commandments. They've heard it audibly from God's own mouth, spoken to them from the mountain. And then as it comes to the end of that chapter 20, um, they actually plead with Moses. They say, God, uh, please, um, don't let us hear this anymore speak to us yourself verse 19 we will listen but do not uh, have God speak to us or we will die this is just too much for us verse 20 Moses said to the people do not be afraid God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning this phenomenal encounter with God this fearful encounter with God all of it is to test them to press on their heart the fear of God which will keep them from sinning again think about what that means for us many times we do have uh, frightful encounters with God the fear of the holiness and the presence and the awe of God overtakes us and what is the response of it it is that we give ourselves to him more we say God thank you I know you more, I trust you more, I fear you more, uh, I will obey you more. That's what happens at this mountain. And now that the instructions continue in chapter 20, 
And for me, always incredible. The first one is it's related to those first three commandments, altars and idols. They're not to have that. If you make an altar of stones for me, uh, I want to make it. I want you to make it as um, not out of dressed stone. God says, but just out of stones that you've picked up, rough stones. Uh, it's sort of. I always imagine God saying, "I like my stones the way that I made them. <laughs> Don't go and dress them square. Uh, if you build me an altar." What is he saying? Make it plain. Don't don't make it like these other guys, uh, fancy temples and things. Just make it plain. Uh, pile up stones and then bring my uh, sacrifices on it. But uh, what I want to draw your attention to when we get to the laws now is the first laws that God's going to expound on then after these instructions, these Ten Commandments. Speaks to servants and slaves. Um, so, as I said, we're going to break it up into three things that happens at the mountain. We're going to come now and speak to the holiness part first, the laws and the instructions. Um, the first one that God establishes at Mount Sinai is their identity. Who are you? You're a royal priesthood. And he's going to speak into this more. I am your God. I'm the only God who audibly speak to you. I'm the God that you will see coming down with fire from heaven. Um, he's making it clear, who am I, who are you, what's our relationship, you're a different kind of people. Then he says to them, you're going to be a holy people, I want you to know what a blessed life looks like. How will you live blessed by me, is if you keep to these instructions. And that's going to speak to the way they dress, it's going to speak to the way they do business, it's going to speak to the way they farm, um, it's going to speak to the food they eat. In absolutely everything, God's going to keep them, give them instructions. And He's making clear to them, you're not going to be like the Egyptians where you came from. You're not going to live like them. You're not going to live like the Canaanites where you are going. You're not going to look like them. This is what you're going to look like. For two years, I'm going to teach you and give you instructions. Um, how you will dress, how you will eat, uh, how you will speak, uh, how you will show honor to parents and to leaders how you will do business, how you will behave towards the land that I'm going to give you. Um, all of these things, God's going to give them instructions. Holy living, just again, keep this in mind. Holy living is blessed living. All right. God is not trying to make them just look like different for the sake of being different. He, he's teaching them, this is the way that I intended for humanity to live always, with one another, with me, with the earth. Because that leads to blessing. And then the third thing is, uh, God's going to speak to them about the tabernacle. He's going to say, I want to live in your midst. In order for me to live in your midst, here is a whole place and a system to show you who I am, what I require of you, and how you will interact with me. Alright, so that's coming at the, uh, in our next session. Holy living then. Um, it's very interesting to me always that uh, one of the first things that God addressed after he gives this general Ten Commandments that speaks to every part of life, he speaks to slaves, speaks to slavery. In chapter 21 he says, uh, if you buy a Hebrew servant, he is to serve you for six years. Isn't it interesting that God uh, says you may own a person? How does that make you feel? <laughs> he says there is a place for slavery. Uh, it's very interesting to me. Because they were slaves in Egypt. And uh, they didn't have a choice of it. They were born into slavery. After they enforced it on them, they were born into slavery generation after generation. And here God comes and he says to them, uh, you can own a Hebrew. But if you read through that, it's very different. So when we think about slavery, we see not Egyptian slavery. Uh, that kind of slavery we don't actually see. Um, we see uh, Western slavery. We see the kind of slavery that happened in England or um, in Spain or so that goes off to another country, to Africa or to India or wherever, that captures people and brings them back and sells them as slaves. Um, 
to an extent it's what happened in Egypt it's just they were born there and everybody from that race were naturally slaves uh, they never had to be bought they were just owned by the people of Egypt now to make it clear God says you are not to do that Israelites you are not to do that um, he actually tells them in uh, chapter 22 verse 21 he says um, do not mistreat an alien or oppress uh, him for you were aliens in Egypt he's saying what the Egyptians did to you you will not do you won't do that to other people if people from other lands come and stay with you um, you will not mistreat them uh, as long as they uh, keep to the laws of the land uh, they enjoy the same rights as you do as a nation all right remember people from other lands could become Israelites if they were circumcised and they kept to the instructions of God uh, so it's not even a bloodline thing it's just you are consecrated that what makes you an Israelite so God says you will not mistreat the aliens but he says if somebody who's a Hebrew falls into a tough time uh, they're unable to feed their families because the ha their harvest failed maybe they are poor farmers they're just not good at farming maybe they're just not good at doing business they've never learned the skills of it uh, then I will provide a way out for them they can come and knock at your door and say to you please my neighbor I cannot feed my kids uh, will you buy me and I will work for you for the next six years and in the seventh year you will let me go in those six years I can learn how to farm better I can learn how to look after my land because I see that you do it well I can learn to do my business because I see that you skilled at that I can maybe learn another trade from you uh, that will put me back on my feet so that in seven years from now I can look after my own family uh, I can get out of debt I can get out of trouble that's what God is saying the parts in that portion though in chapter 21 that bother us is the fact that I then can treat my neighbor that I've now bought as a slave I can treat him like a child in my house if he does not obey me uh, according to this in those days I could give him a hiding and I can give him a proper hiding why because there's no other way that I can make him obey I feed him I clothe him uh, I look after him I give him shelter over his head all of those things if I do not feed him the next day he won't be much worth to me working on the farm uh, he'll be too tired he won't have the energy if I don't uh, give him his bed well he's gonna get sick and then he's not much worth to me everything he has belongs to me so I must give him medicine I must make him well again the only way I can get this man to obey me is if I give him a good hiding just like I would have done with one of my kids over there so um, God makes it very clear also then that while I can give him a hiding I cannot mistreat him I can't beat him up I must be careful I must behave well towards him as a master and those kind of laws are in there that says if I knock out his tooth he's free I bought him as a slave I paid this money for him but if I mistreat him if I hit him with a fist and I knock out his eye or I injure him uh, in the mouth I knock out his teeth or something then I must let him go so there's laws in place to govern this relationship in order to allow somebody to get back on their feet now also to make it clear we're going to read in the laws that I cannot go and steal somebody and make them a slave uh, that's called kidnapping and for kidnapping if I'm caught I'm put to death so the kind of slavery that God allows in his nation is um, the kind of slavery that would allow somebody to get out of debt it's a system that God puts in place to say you can own somebody and that owning them for a period of time not for life will allow them to get out of debt at the end of that uh, we've heard Rob speak about this so beautifully before at the end of that if the slave tells me um, listen I'm so happy here uh, I'm I'm fulfilled in your house my children are happy and taken care of I don't want to go and own my own land again I don't want to start up my own business can I just stay with you you can continue to own me as your slave uh, I will continue to give up my rights for you 
then uh, they can become a bond servant, willingly a slave for life. And that's the kind of servant that Paul speaks about in the New Testament when he says, I am Christ's bond servant. I'm not forced uh, to be owned by him for life. I'm willingly owned by him. I give myself to him. That's the attitude of heart that God desires of us. Uh, then there's this whole ritual where you put the ear of the slave to the door and you um, punch a hole through it. And that will be a sign then for the rest of his life that I'm owned by this man, my master. Um, it's, it's a beautiful imagery for us. All right. So that's then the first and the difficult one to, to see that God allows slavery in his land. But he, it's a different kind of slavery than we would normally see in other nations. Um, consider the fact that we call the Lord my Lord. Uh, because everything in us as Western people opposes this whole thought of I, I cannot be owned by somebody else. But in Christianity, I call Jesus my Lord. The whole imagery of that is I willingly call him my master. The one that owns me, the one that can tell me what I need to do and not. Um, that's the kind of heart that God desires. Let's move on from that. All right. Um, then God's going to give them a rhythm of life. And that's, this we're going to see a few times coming through the laws. God enforces this rhythm of life for the Israelites. Certain feasts and certain days. And the first of those is the Sabbath. Now again, as slaves, they were never given a day off in Egypt. Um, so very often when we look at the laws, our heart's attitudes towards the laws is sort of, oh, I'm forced to do something. Um, I have to do this. God is not asking me, he's telling me. All right. Um, for the Israelites, just see the heart behind the laws. God's heart is beautiful. Everything that he tells them, I want you to do this, it's a blessing. It's an absolute blessing that God tells them that way of living and that he requires it of them because it's good for them. We have to keep in mind everything that God tells us to do is good for us also. When we read through the New Testament and Jesus gives instructions and laws, uh, all of it is to recognize that God loves me and he wants to bless me. All right, If I don't do it, I'm not blessed. Life just doesn't flow the way that God intended it to. So the first one is the Sabbath. God says, once a week you will not work. But I really want to, God. Don't. <laughs> All right? God just comes and tells them plainly, don't. If you work, you are not part of my nation. So see again the heart behind it. God is telling them, listen. I own you now. I brought you out of slavery where you had to work every single day of the week. You never rested. I'm telling you as your master now, you won't. For them, it's a blessing. They hear, oh, wow. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. We, we are obliged to rest once a week. Um, well, very soon, the blessing turns into a into a, a, a heavy demand on them. When? Only when they start fearing. Oh, uh, am I going to have enough? Uh, is the fields going to be okay? Uh, must I not maybe do this on the rest day? Will I supply enough for myself? All of those worries, that's the only thing that's going to steal the blessing from resting. Uh, the fear of not producing enough, not earning enough. But God keeps them in check and says, no, you won't. You will trust me that you will have enough. Uh, I will supply your needs. And then these three feasts that they have to keep every year, this rhythm of reminders that God built into the year. The one is the unleavened bread. It's that week-long feast of remembering the Passover, the day that we left Egypt. So God tells them, you're going to have a rhythm of living where every year you will remind yourself as a nation for an entire week that I brought you out of slavery. I freed you and I brought you to a promised land. Uh, I took you out of this yoke, this heavy burden of being owned by this master, Pharaoh. I freed you. 
Um, the second thing that they have to remember is at sowing time. At sowing time, they have to take some of that fruit of the stuff that they're going to sow, and that's the first fruits that they have to give to God. So even before it goes into the ground, God tells them, I want you to take a portion of that and give it to me. But what if I don't have enough to put into the ground? Have faith is what God telling them. He says, have faith. I will give you a big yield. So even before you sow, give some of it to me. Uh, in trust that I will supply your needs. It's a faith move uh, that God is enforcing on them once a year. It's this feast of the first fruits. And then at the end of the year, when they take in the harvest, uh, there's the feast of the ingathering, the feast of the harvest uh, being reaped. And again, God tells them, take some of that and of the first of it, give it to me. Um, but what if I don't have enough for the next year? Trust me, is what God is saying. It's a faith harvest again. So in these three feasts, it's this rhythm that God gets them into as a nation, a rhythm of reminder, a rhythm of joyful reminder that I'm the one who saved you, I brought you out of slavery. I'm the God who's going to give you a harvest. And when you bring in the harvest, I'm the God that's going to make it enough to last you an entire season again, an entire year. Beautiful rhythms. Um, but we'll, we'll read a lot of that still. God is going to reinforce that again. We're going to see it in Deuteronomy and Leviticus. It's going to come through again and again. Then I want to call your attention to the second last thing, chapter 23. We're going to stop in chapter 24. The second last thing. Um, read with me chapter 23 from verse 20. Um, see, I'm sending an angel ahead of you to guard you along the way and to bring you to the place that I've prepared. Pay attention to him and listen to what he says. Do not rebel against him. He will not forgive your rebellion since my name is in him. If you listen carefully to what he says and do all that I say, I will be an enemy to your enemies and will oppose those who oppose you. My angel will go ahead of you um, and bring you into the land of the Amorites, the Hittites, um, this whole thing. Do not bow down before they go to worship them. Worship me, the Lord says. Now, we're going to meet this angel along the way still. In fact, right as they go, um, they're going to, well, as Moses is on the mountain, they're going to bring that, uh, build the calf, and then God's going to say, um, Moses, you better go down. We're going to speak about that because they are uh, building an altar to uh, an idol. And God says to Moses, I'm going to wipe them out. And then he says, but Lord, um, how will the people know that you are with us if you wipe them out? And then he says, please go with us. If you don't go with us, I don't want to go alone. So Moses intrigues the Lord for this and says, please, you have to go with us. If you don't go with us, we don't want to go. Um, and we see that God fulfills that promise that an angel is going to go ahead of you. Uh, the head of the angel army is going for you. And as they go into the promised land, Joshua meets this angel face to face. Uh, and he says, I'm the head of the angel armies. In other words, I've been with you for 40 years in this desert. Even though you don't see me every day, I'm with you. Now, <laughs> the Lord is with us. And sometimes we don't recognize how physically he is with us. That his angel truly guards over us. He's really with us. And these people had to keep faith in this promise that there's an angel guarding our way. There's an angel um, looking out for us and taking us to the right place. And when they lost faith of that, things are bad. So, beautiful. We're going to meet that angel along the way still. Now, in chapter 24, uh, they again have this powerful encounter with God. And God says to Moses, I want you to come up to me again. Come up and meet with me again. So there's several times of up and down the mountain. Um, come up and meet with me again. But this time, I want you to bring with um, Aaron, your brother. He's going to be the high priest. Not up in a BU. It's going to be, uh, it's his two sons. He's going to come with you. And then 70 of the elders. One of those elders is Joshua. Another one is her. We get some of their names. Um, come up and meet with me on the mountain 
the Lord says. Now, early the next morning, uh, he gathered the nation around the mountain again, and Moses built an altar there uh, at the foot of the mountain. And he sent some of the young men, and they had to come and go and get um, sacrifices prepared and bring it to the Lord. So everybody's standing at the foot of the mountain at the start of this, this meeting. And then uh, God tells him in verse 9, he says, When you come up the mountain, you and them will see me. You will see me. Now up until this point, the nation have heard God, but now God's going to say, You, Aaron, uh, not up in the pew, and 70 elders, 74 people will see me on the mountain. God is continuing the revelation of who he is. He's continuing to open up their eyes to who he is, not just through miracles and provision and wonders and all of these things, but then audibly hearing God and then seeing God. Um, he's In all of these their senses, he's building an image of who he is. Compare it again to all of the idols that the people worship. They never seen, they never heard, they never um, seem to do these wonders that God has got. God is showing himself to be very, very different from all the gods that the nations around them worship. And so they come up on the mountain and God says to him, come and fetch from me uh, the laws that I've spoken to you. In other words, in chapter 20, those 10 commandments, come and fetch from me the tablets of stone on which I wrote down these instructions. In other words, it's done. It's written down. Come and get it from me. So they go up the mountain and um, God then says to Moses and to Joshua, the two of them particularly, you guys come closer and let the, um, the Aaron, Nadab, Abihu uh, and the 70 elders, let them wait over there for me, for the 69 elders now. And you guys come closer. But there, I want to read it to you. They saw the God of Israel. Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu and the 70 elders of Israel went up and saw the God of Israel. Under his feet was something like a pavement of sapphire, clear as the sky itself. But God did not raise his hand against these leaders of Israel. They saw God and they ate and they drank. There was this meeting, an intimate meeting with God. Now this picture that they saw over there, for the rest of scripture, we're going to see it again and again and again. Isaiah saw this picture of God sitting on his throne with a sapphire floor, clear as the sky. <laughs> with that, the vision included also the four creatures around the throne uh, with the faces filled with eyes and the six wings. Um, John saw this as well. Uh, Ezekiel saw this as well. Uh, now think about the scope of time, a hundred years uh, B A C. <laughs> uh, John saw it. Over here, where are we sitting? Is it 1,200 about? Uh, before Christ? And then in between Isaiah, I Ezekiel, Daniel. Uh, and yet this throne never changed. The scene of God on his throne on a sapphire floor, it never changed. Uh, kingdoms came and went, but this never changed. This God reigning from his throne never changed. The vision is still the same. And we too, one day, will see this. And praise God, just like these guys, we will see it under the blood of Christ, in his mercy, and we will live. We will live to continue to see this. This will be our, our foreland. <laughs> and then Moses and Joshua went up closer into God's presence and it says the people standing at the bottom uh, saw the glory of God coming down on the mountain and it looked like fire like a consuming fire on the mountain it covered the top of the mountain and they saw Moses and Joshua going up into it and then Moses remained on the mountain for 40 days uh, for six days this glory cloud filled the mountain, this consuming fire. After six days, if I read it right, that left 
but Moses and Joshua didn't come back. The 70 elders came back down the mountain, but Moses and Joshua was gone. And so in the people mind, as we continue the story now, uh, with the building of the calf, we're going to see that they think, what? He's dead. He's not coming back. The elders came back and the fire, the consuming fire is not seen anymore, but Moses is not back. And while Moses is receiving on top of the mountain these instructions for the tabernacle from God, they at the mountain, at the foot of the mountain, decide, our leader is dead. He doesn't live anymore. And our God, where is he? The, the fire on the mountain is gone. What now? What now? And so they built this calf. After these incredible encounters with God, fear of being deserted, leaderless, godless in the desert, overcomes them. And they built themselves an altar. And these stones that Moses went and fetched from God and as he came down, he breaks it. So there we're going to pick up the story again. And God, we want to plead that um, you will call to mind those powerful encounters with you again. And I pray also for your conviction that you will call to mind in places where we forgot those encounters and we felt deserted in whatever way. We felt left behind and fear overcame us. And so we went to altars. We went to idols to try and find security in something other than you. Uh, speak to our hearts, Father God. And we just thank you, Lord, that your instructions to us is always to bless us. Always, always to bless us. Whatever you call us into, Father God, is to bless us and to build us up and to give us a future um, and to make us a blessing to other people. We praise you for that, Father God. Amen. So, will you read then from chapter 25 onwards, start to read some of the instructions uh, that God gives for the building of the tabernacle. Um, now to help you with that, uh, we're going to read that this is how you must build it, God told him. And then the chapters following that is going to speak about, and they build it exactly that way. So there's a repetition of the instructions for the tabernacle. Um, I'll post on the group, I'll post a, a, a picture just of the tabernacle, so that you can, while you read through it, you can see it. Uh, and that's going to be our discussion then in the next session. Thank you. God bless you.